in some sense, uh, we can always see Putin's politics as the continuation of the Cold War. In some ways, when you see Putin, you uh, realize that the 20th century is not over yet. How do we understand the historical context and the present drivers of the war in Ukraine? I spoke with Sebastian Chatov, who grew up in the Soviet Union, to get his perspectives on the situation in Russia and its war with its neighbor. If you enjoyed this analysis, you might want to check out the full conversation that's linked in the description below. Enjoy. But, but first, let's, let's delve into what is, in your view, is the, the kind of psychology behind him as a leader. Uh, yes, uh, with the disclaimer that um, I am not a trained psychoanalyst, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, somebody familiar with his general uh, trajectories through life. Um, Putin is from uh, St. Petersburg. Uh, you know, he, his great grandfather was the cook of one of Lenin's sisters, you know, so this secured maybe the family some sort of standing uh, but they were by no means rich. I would say they were they were poor. You know, um, they were they were really average even by Soviet standards. What uh, what happened in the seventies, particularly, uh, but also in the eighties and in the nineties in the Soviet Union, one uh, prevailing uh, thing uh, for Soviet youth to indulge in was Gopnik culture. Um, this is not dissimilar to Chav culture in the UK, perhaps uh, the Neds in Scotland or the Scullies in uh, Ireland, perhaps the Raquet in, Fra in France, perhaps our own uh, township Totsis here. Um, Gopniks um, are essentially disaffected youth from the proletarian uh, outskirts of uh, cities, you know, these uh, big concrete blocks of flats and the housing estates that they comprise. Um, who I suppose out of boredom and for some set of an, uh, amusements uh, developed their own uh, subculture. Now in the Soviet Union in the, uh, at the time, you know, a young uh, sort of teenager had, you know, some options like he could go to the library or he could, you know, take up some sports, um, perhaps, you know, start the French lessons or something like that. But, there wasn't really uh, much of a network of, you know, let's say cafes or, or, or anywhere else you could go to meet your friends to just hang out. So uh, Russian youth, uh, you know, Soviet youth, because this was also more broadly uh, prevalent uh, along, um, along the whole of the Soviet Union, um, they divided essentially the cities uh, um, amongst themselves into, you know, their little districts where they ruled the roost and... Uh, they, um, shall we say, code of conduct, code of honor, if we call it that, uh, was based on the Russian uh, kind of gangster criminal uh, prison code, you know, that has developed in uh, Russian prisons over centuries. And um, they, there is um, some sort of, it, it, it warrants a bit of a nuance there. So um, the way, uh, the Gopniks uh, see the world is they divide it into two, you know, essential broad groups. On the one side are the Gopniks. They don't call themselves that. Uh, you know, they call themselves Chokie uh, Patsane. This is something like proper lads. You know, they're the real lads. And everybody else is a loch or kind of a schmo, a dummy. Um, and uh, to um, shake down a schmo is a sort of a sacred act almost for a Gopnik. Uh, but uh, it, it has to be done without sort of overt aggression, uh, certainly, obviously so. For example, you know, when your township Totsi or in the streets of Jogo wants to mug you, he pulls a knife or a gun at you and takes your wallet and runs away. Uh, the way a Russian Gopnik uh, accosts, for example, um, its intended victim, victim uh, is that they get stuck supposedly for a chat and they say for example uh, David um, do you have a cell phone because I have my own sim card uh, that I, and I'd like to make a call and uh, for example David would say no now the Gopnik would then say well what if I find one now from a Gopnik perspective you know um, you have provoked him because you were untruthful to him 
and Nazis then the legitimate reason to assault you. Now that mm -hmm. Gopnik culture is, you know, prevalent. It's millions of Soviet youth engaged in it. You know, I caught it's if not heyday, then certain popularity in the 90s. I believe it's quietened down uh, since then. It's become less uh, fashionable, but certainly Putin's generation comes from that, you know. And to some extent, you know, Russia is a Gopnik state. You know, they certainly cause provocation, but then they seem to impose themselves as the uh, people who were, you know, hard done out of. Uh, you know, um, there's a rather impolite saying that renders something uh, along the lines of, um, don't urinate in my pocket and tell me it's raining, you know, which is, uh, you know, the kind of first thing that you want to say mm -hmm. to that. Uh, but uh, let's, uh, let's uh, move further with Putin. You know, he uh, then uh, joined the, the KGB. Um, uh, for that, he had to do university in St. Petersburg. So he uh, studied law as well. Uh, his career is not of a super sleuth or anything like that. Uh, you know, he was posted to East Germany, you know, which was a friendly state. It was a Warsaw Pact state, you know, uh, with a view of uh, proving himself of whether he's capable of being posted to capitalist countries, you know, to deal with the real bourgeois enemy and all that, you know, and some, so, uh, some sorts of little bits are indicative, you know, for example, uh, in Dresden, he shared an office with a colleague, so he wasn't important enough to have his own office. He had an office job, you know, he, he, you know, um, he, he rummaged through the um, archives, uh, you know, gathered all sorts of information, but he wasn't a type of, you know, Russian James Bond in any sense. Um, however, you know, the KGB schooling is quite distracted in its own way, because a KGB officer does not see the world, uh, you know, through perhaps the prism that you and I see it, and they have a very specific mindset. And uh, to them, you know, they see the world in terms of uh, special operations and active measures and uh, some sort of um, standoff between, you know, uh, powerful enemies and um, those sorts of conflicts. And um, they are well prepared uh, for that sort of world. But they are not necessarily prepared in seeing the world uh, in terms of organic processes, for example, that happen. Uh, so, you know, the 2004 uh, protest action in Ukraine that we saw, the so-called Euromaidan, and Maidan is the central square in Kiev, the KGB officer is likely to see as some sort of a, a foreign provocation, a US-inspired, you know, act and whatever. It, uh, it doesn't have perhaps the conceptual capability to see that this is perhaps really a genuine expression of outrage that, uh, you know, your leadership, as in the then president, who was uh, controlled by Russia and then had to leave and left to Russia, you know, uh, that he had betrayed, you know, the national aspirations. And uh, an another point about KGB officers is um, this is something that Putin has himself expressed, and that is that they feel that uh, the demise of the Soviet Union was one of the greatest geopolitical tragedies of the 20th century. At another occasion, Putin has also said that the USSR demise has, for him, been also the greatest personal tragedy. And there is a sense that, uh, you know, security, uh, certainly operatives, you know, the military, they lost the Cold War without a fight. And um, in some sense, uh, we can See, always sense politics as the continuation of the Cold War. In some ways, when you see Putin, you uh, realize that the 20th century is not over yet. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this analysis, you might want to check out the full interview with Sebastian Chatov. That's linked over here. And I'd also be grateful if you could subscribe to my other channel. That's linked over here. My name is David Ansara. This is the CRA. Until next time, take care.